All right, well, let's get started. <clears throat> Excuse me, my name is Mark Edlin, and uh, welcome to another episode of the Diatom Web Academy. It's brought to you by diatoms.org and the Taxonomic Certification Committee of the Society of Freshwater Science. Um, if you want to in the chat, let us know where you're, you're checking in from. And of course, we want to always extend our a welcome to anyone who'd like to, to do, a, do a presentation in the future. Uh, we're looking for uh, presenters into, into the month of September. And I also want to note that upcoming in, <clears throat> in September, we have uh, Kath, Kathleen Stuf, uh, like, like centering uh, presenting on ancient sedimentary DNA on September 14th. So put that on, on your calendars as well. Um, we'll be taking a short break during the month of August because the International Diatom Symposium is occurring um, and today is the last day for uh, registration if you want to do a presentation. I've put a link in the chat where you can go to um, find information for, pre for uh, registering and, and presenting on that. Um, during today's, uh, today's presentation, we'll, um, uh, Sylvia Lee will be, will be doing the presentation. We'll hold questions till the end. You're gonna, you can uh, chat your question in the end or you can raise your hand and uh, ask, ask directly if you'd prefer. With that, I want to uh, I want to welcome today's speaker, Sylvia Lee. Sylvia is a uh, biologist with the Office of Research and Development with the uh, United States Environmental Protection Agency. She's also um, been the one of the current professors for the um, Ecology and Systematics of uh, Diatom class that is taught annually at um, at uh, Iowa Lakeside Laboratory here in the states. Um, Sylvia comes to us today from hot and humid Florida, and will be presenting on uh, the keeled diatoms. Thank you, Sylvia, for your presentation today, and we're looking forward to it. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction, and thanks everyone for joining. I'll be talking today about the keeled diatoms, and I'm gonna start us off with a warm-up poll. So look at these images, A, B, and C, and you can put in the chat which image is not a keeled diatom. All right, great. I'm seeing lots of Cs. So either you remember um, this diatom, which is a diplonius from the previous Web Academy, or you have some idea of what a keeled diatom is. So here's an overview of my talk today. Um, we'll go over the characteristics that make a keeled diatom. Uh, we'll talk about, um, a, in general, the many um, genera in this group. And then I will go over some recent taxonomic work um, that has contributed to our understanding of this uh, broad group. So what is a keeled diatom? It's all about the wraith. And the wraith of a keeled diatom is eccentric, which is that it's along the margin here, or it is circumferential, which means it goes all the way around the valve uh, margin, or semi-circumferential, which means it's not quite all the way around. The wraith is also in a canal, and it's often elevated from the valve surface by the keel. So what is a keel? Um, if you're like me and don't know very much about boats, you would not have um, known what a keel is. And um, on a boat, these sailboats shown here, there's this part of the boat that goes below the water and provides structure for the boat there. And it's extending, it's extending down below the water. Um, and 
in a diatom, that would be the part of the valve that contains that wraith within a canal. And as in boats, there are a variety of keels. Um, in sailboats, we've got full keels and wing keels. And um, we also have uh, regular keels in diatoms, like the one shown here, and a more um, ornamented and extended keel called a wing. So the canal wraith, the canal part of it uh, refers to a tubular channel. So you can see here in these figures, we have a tubular channel and the wraith slit runs along the top of this channel. And this uh, channel, the canal, may be sitting right on top of the valve margin or it could be raised on that keel, as I talked about before. And there are other uh, features, structures that are associated with these canal rapes. Um, we have these bars of silica called fibula. And again, these more extended um, keels are called wings that really elevates the canal from the um, valve surface. They are supported by alar canals, here noted with the blue arrows, and they may have um, these window-like structures called fenestra, and within those windows have fenestral bars. And we'll see this um, characteristic um, in the genus Iconella a bit later on. Some more morphological terms here. Um, again, the fibulae, which is the plural of fibula, are these internal bars or braces that support the rafe canal. So here you see this uh, fibulae um, in the light micrograph. And then this is a scanning electron micrograph of the internal view of this diatom. And these thickened silica areas are the fibulae. And if you um, zoom in a bit closer to this area, which is shown here, you'll see the underside of the rave slit and this opening um, here is called the portula. And you can see three uh, portulae in this uh, image that are um, connecting the inside of the rafe canal with the inside of the cell. Another um, feature that is used in identifying diatoms in this group are the central nodules. And this is an, a thickly silicified area between the proximal wraith ends. So um, this is the wraith slit here on this diatom. And where those wraith uh, ends in this little curve, this um, is the proximal wraith ends. You can see both sides here. And in the center is the central nodule. Um, and in some of uh, the diatoms in this group, the fibulae are interrupted by that central nodule. And in some, it's not there. And um, to note, about the central nodule, that is where the valve formation begins. So when the diatom starts laying down the first um, bits of silica, that's where it starts at the central nodule here in naviculoid diatoms at the center of the valve face. And then in the keeled diatoms um, here in the margin on the side or at one of the poles. So to talk about the keel diatom genera, um, the keel diatoms is really an informal grouping 
uh, based on morphology and um, includes th uh, three large groups of diatoms that have canal rapes. Mm -hmm. And that includes the order Vasilariales, uh, which is shown here, um, some representatives in green on this phylogenetic tree. And we also have the orders Ropalodiales and the Surarelales here in red and blue. And this is um, what I'm showing are two parts of the same tree um, because I couldn't fit all of it on one slide, but this um, is from a single tree. And um, you can see that this group, the Bacillariales, um, is separated by many um, naviculoid diatoms. And then down here on this part of that tree, um, you can see that we have um, representatives of the group Ropilodiales and then the Surarelloid diatoms. So based on this work, uh, molecular work by Ruck and Terrio, um, we can see that these Vasilariales group is only distantly related to um, the Robolodiales and Surarelales. And that means um, that the, although all of these three orders have a canal wraith, um, the canal wraith uh, evolved um, at least two times, once in the Bacillariales and another time in, in this group here. Also, you'll notice that in this tree, the, um, these two orders are in the same part of the tree and the Ropolodiales are firmly nested within the Surrelales. So a take home from this is that their treatment in the classification of these two orders cannot be done separately. You have to look at them together. And then recent work from uh, Mann et al. Uh, took what was available in terms of molecular data for the Bacillariales and started the process of um, reassessing um, the classification of this group. And then later on in the talk, we'll go further into work by Elizabeth Ruck and colleagues um, on these other groups here. So this is a, another phylogenetic tree um, from that recent work by Mann et al. And um, it's quite a few um, representatives um, shown in this group. Um, it has eight major clades included in this tree and the different um, genera that are included in the bacillaries um, are shown in different colors. So we have Bacillaria, Hanchia, Samodictyon, Triblianella, Cylindrotheca, um, as well as Denticula, and then a couple marine Bacillariales. And um, what they concluded from this work is that um, there is still work to be done um, because if you look at the other parts of the tree that are in light blue, um, it includes many uh, Nichia. Uh, Nichia is a big genus containing um, over 800 taxa. And um, based on this molecular work, um, several groups um, can be found within this large group and further work, including verification of taxa um, within the uh, genetic libraries um, still needs to be done to further um, develop an understanding of how 
the Bacillariales should be um, reclassified. But what I'll do today is go over um, these uh, genera that we still know about um, in this group. So this is Bacillaria, and um, it is the first diatom that was ever described. It has um, a keel that's actually a bit more central um, than an eccentric. It has uh, frustules um, in a colony that slide along together along the reef, um, as you can see in the video. And they are found in brackish to marine habitats, as well as uh, waters with high total dissolved solids. Next, we have Cylindrotheca. Um, these frustules are very needle-like. And what's interesting about this genus is that the keel uh, wraps around the frustule. And that allows this diatom to rotate as they move um, through oftentimes soils, muddy seeps, uh, prairie streams, um, those kinds of habitats. Um, they're often missed in light micro microscopes uh, because of the cleaning process and the fact that these cells are very lightly solicified. So usual processing of um, diatom samples will often break up um, these lightly solidified frustules. Next is Hanshia. This is a common uh, terrestrial diatom. It's often found in soils and um, it forms these heavily solidified internal valves, um, which is one mechanism for um, being able to survive changes in the environment, such as in soils that can become wet and dry um, on and off. And um, this genus has something called Hanshioid symmetry, which means that if you look at a cross section of the diatom frustule, you'll find the rafe, canal rafe is on the same side on both valves. And if you want to look, um, read more about the uh, molecular and morphological findings, you can go to this paper, um, recent paper by Maltsev et al. Uh, where they treated the group Hanshia amphioxus sensulato, which is a very um, widely distributed um, Hanshia. Nichia um, is that very large group. Um, it has uniseriate striae, uh, usually epipelic, which means it's in the sediments and they're usually solitary, but there are a few surprising ones that are planktonic, like this colony of Nichia fruticosa. And it has um, hanshioid symmetry or diagonal symmetry where the rapes are on opposite sides of the frustule. And you can see that also here in girdle view where um, the bottom valve here has, you cannot see the wraith in focus. And on the top, you can see the wraith and fibulae in focus. And um, here's another uh, example of fibulae, um, the wraith canal, um, where it's not interrupted by a central nodule. And then some examples here where that um, fibulae are interrupted by a central nodule. And one of the reasons why there are so many um, diatom species in this genus, um, and uh, a lot of it is not well resolved, 
is because of these delicate features where they have very fine striae and um, not that many features that you can see um, well in light micrographs. So with more um, SEM work and molecular work, um, should be able to um, better resolve this group in the future. Here is Triblianella. It also has nichioid symmetry like nichia, um, but it has an undulate valve face. And you can see that um, in this SEM here, as well as here, the valve face is undulate. It also has um, transapical striae on the external surface of the valve, which are these thick rib-like structures, which are the costae. And these are often found in marine waters or fresh waters with higher conductivity. Next, we have Samodictyon. Um, which has a pandoriform valve outline where it's constricted in the center. Um, again, it has, like Triblianella, an undulate valve face, um, but it's also um, very loculate, which means it has these uh, pockets. You can really see that here in these specimens and here in the light micrograph of um, these particular specimens, which are from Guam. Um, and like the um, name suggests, Samodictyon, they are often associated with sandy habitats. Denticula is um, also related to Nichia, has Nichioid symmetry and on the internal side of the valve, it has these um, thickened fibulae, internal fibulae. Um, the, the arrow heads are pointing here to the fibulae. And then the, um, the arrows are pointing to the portula. And these thickened fibulae give it a teeth-like um, appearance, um, hence the name denticula. Here's another um, genus um, made up typically of very small valves, and they're often overlooked um, because they look like small nichia. Um, but what's very interesting about this genus is that it shares um, features of the wraith that are similar to nichia, as well as the group we'll talk about um, later, um, the sororelloids. And that is because the canal wraith is on a wing with fenestrae. And um, if you remember this diagram, it has these um, extended keels with the windows, which are fenestrae. And you can see that here, um, this SEM. And uh, further work with um, the ultrastructure of diatoms in this group um, by Witkowski et al. has found that there are these pores or poroids um, on the fibula, on the, on the internal surface. And they have proposed that um, this canal wraith system is another um, distinct type of canal wraith system, the Simon Senioid um, canal rate system. So um, we've covered the Bacillariales group so far. And next we'll talk about the Surrelales and the Ropolodiales um, and relate that um, to the um, very important work um, by Elizabeth Ruck and her colleagues um, that have um, delved into this group. And um, what 
what these um, authors did was they analyzed the nuclear um, plastid, sorry, that's a typo, and mitochondrial genomes of over 200 representatives of these two orders. They also tested um, a couple evolutionary hypotheses about cell symmetry, as well as habitat transitions. And I won't go into much detail, um, except to say that the cell symmetry um, hypothesis um, asks whether this symmetry where the um, apical axis is longer than the transapical axis um, in genera like um, uh, epithemia, did those have to um, go through a um, intermediate symmetry where the apical and transapical axis um, are similar in size in order to evolve into um, a valve structure that has a longer um, transapical axis? And the habitat transition um, hypothesis is about um, the diatom genera um, moving from uh, marine to brackish to fresh waters. And what we'll focus on next are these proposed genus level reclassifications um, from this work. So here I've laid out um, this new classification based on the phylogenetic data um, by Ruck et al. And um, in this summary, um, you can see a few things. Um, the order Ropolodiales is subsumed into the Surarellales. And um, there are some um, terms here you might notice like fastuosi, fastuose, um, those are um, informal groups based on morphology by earlier researchers. And um, these groups are helpful in our interpretation of the uh, phylogenetic data and also show that um, the morphological simil similarities across genera, for example, the Campylodiscus um, fastuosi and the Sororella fastuose, they have been previously noted and um, they do support, the morphology um, supports the molecular findings. So there are three major changes that we can break down the new um, classification, which are the subsumed genera. Um, that's first. So um, epithemia was broadened to include ropolodia and uh, cymatopleura is now subsumed into surarella and then uh, stenopterobia is uh, subsumed into a resurrected um, genus Iconella. And second, we have a reclassification of the genus Campylodiscus um, in three ways. You have um, the species that are um, most similar to the genotype the type of this genus, Campylodiscus clypeus. Then you have um, Campylodiscus in the robusti group, and then the marine Campylodiscus um, is now placed in a new genus, Coronia. And finally, um, the Surarellas are also reclassified in three ways. Um, the fastuose group is now within Campylodiscus. The pinate group, um, which is um, similar to the type species, uh, Surarella striatula, and the robuste group, um, again, uh, put into Iconella. 
And um, the Ruck um, paper also treats um, some of these marine genera as well. So when I talk about um, these reclassifications, um, what I'll note is um, the synapomorphies um, uh, presented in um, the paper. And this is important to understand um, because um, synapomorphies are these derived traits that are shared by individuals, um, in our case, within a genus. And um, a one way to think about that, to understand it better, is in comparison with homoplasy, um, which is when these um, derived traits do not share a common ancestor. So that would be, for example, like the canal rates in the Bacillariales and the Surreales. So epithemia, um, I'm showing here um, the uh, phylogenetic tree um, shown in the Ruck et al. paper and the synapomorphy, which is that the fibulae extend into the valve face. So in this epithemia turgida, you can see that the fibulae extend um, across the valve face and does that here also. And I know for many of us, um, it's hard to look at this and say it's epithemia, epithemia gibba, um, but that is the name now. And the um, interesting um, thing about this group is they have um, nitrogen fixing endosymbiotic um, spheroid bodies. And um, as we mentioned, uh, the International Dieton Symposium will be uh, next uh, month. And there will be a very interesting talk on the subject of the spheroid bodies by Heidi Abresh from University of Montana. Entomoneus um, was a, a monophyletic group. Um, and the synapomorphy for this genus is that the canal wraith is raised on a sigmoid keel. And you can see that very well in these really great SEM photos. Um, the sigmoid wraith canal is shown here on the external view of the valve. And then on the internal view of the valve, um, the wraith you can see the wraith slit here through this opening. And then these bars are the fibulae. Campylodiscus. Um, so this includes the fastuose group um, and the synapomorphy is communication between the wraith canal and the cell interior through a structure called the infundibula, which is highlighted in red here. Um, the chalice or funnel shaped structure um, shown here as well as here. And uh, interesting um, thing I found out about um, this group is the um, genotype Campylodiscus clypeus um, was found, first found in diatomite. And um, there is a rich deposit dominated by this um, species in um, the region of um, near Czech Republic now in, in diatomite. And it seems that um, there was a dominance of this group in subfossil um, times. Next, Spirula, and here the synapomorphy is communication um, between the wraith canal and the cell interior through simple portulae. So um, simple portulae, you can see here these openings, and these uh, portulae are created by fibulae, um, the bars of various um, thickness. And um, 
this includes what was formerly called Cymatopleura solia and Cymatopleura elliptica. And uh, another um, way to distinguish this group, Cirrella, from what I'll show next, which is Iconella, is that um, it has a rafe canal that sits on the valve mantle and not on an extended keel or wing. And a little interesting factoid um, I learned about Cirrella was the generic type was first described by Turpin from a collection by a French medical doctor, Surare. So that's why it's called Surarella. And finally, we have Iconella, um, which are these robust um, frustules with a canal wraith that uh, rises above the valve surface on a wing. And the synapomorphy is uniformly porous alar canals, um, but that's uh, pretty hard to see in LM. So um, you can focus on the wing and the fenestrae to um, ident identify this genus. And uh, you can see this very um, extended wing keel here um, with the little windows and um, fenestral bars. Um, this is a really neat uh, image where this um, Iconella has the um, suspicious tendrils that can attach to sediment particles um, in lake sediments, for example. And uh, we have um, what used to be not, what used to be Stenopterobia is also within this group. Um, you can see that it falls within um, the the tree here. Um, it also has that um, extended uh, keel with um, the fenestrae and fenestral bars. Um, and this is an example from what used to be Campylodiscus in the Robuste group, now um, classified into Iconella. And here's um, another diagram of Iconella morphology, um, which we've used previously to talk about Surarella, but now um, it is Iconella. And you can see the internal valve view here. Um, the alar canals are these, um, these canals here, these channels, um, which connects the rafe canal to the interior of the, the frustule. And again, the fenestral bars and fenestrae. And then this is a nice external view of that circumferential um, canal rafe and rafe slit. So we've covered um, what is now the Surrelalies, um, both uh, groups here. And um, I want to end by acknowledging um, many, many researchers who've worked in some way, um, contributed to the uh, literature that I've um, read to prepare this talk. I'm really just a messenger of the work by uh, many people. Um, and this is not in any particular order, um, but I wanted to acknowledge um, the work of all of these folks and possibly others that I missed. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank, thank you very much, Sylvia. I really appreciate that. It's, oh, it's another one of these wait, these diatom wake up calls for us like okay okay i gotta rethink this stuff um if people would like to ask questions please feel free to uh type your questions in the chat and we'll pose them to sylvia or if you'd like um go ahead and and uh raise your hand uh, and do that use the the hand raising tool and we can um we can uh call on you and just uh and go ahead and do that i don't see any hands raised just yet 
I wanted to ask you one quick question, Sylvia. What happened to the genus? There was a genus called Petrodictyon that got uh, it was it was you know Cirella gamma. What where did did that just where did that end up? You're, um, I think that's still a thing. Petrodictyon is okay. still a yeah. Um, I think I can't remember if that was one of the genera that where the um, monophyly was um, questionable or not yet resolved. Um, but that I didn't um, really go over the marine genera here, but it still exists. <laughs> Okay, good, good. I, I, I wanted to know if I, if I, if I had to go and change, change something else. Um, I've got a question from Paula. Um, it's a great talk, Sylvia. She says, I keep trying to wrap my, my, my brain around this Ropelodia epithemia update and uh, took a look at the Dona website and saw that epithemia is still listed under the Ropelodia ailes. Um, is this something that we need to update? Uh, and their second question is, are, are all of the Ropelodia moved into epithemia or are some moved and others still remain? Yes, I'm trying to wrap my brain around that also. And um, good question, Paula. Um, we do need to um, update that on Dona. Um, and we've been purposely um, being careful about the things that we do update in DONA um, to make sure we have, uh, we do this in a systematic way um, that doesn't miss something and, con and becomes confusing. So um, that will be updated um, in the future. And I'm showing this slide now um, of uh, a, marine um, ropolodia, these worm-like ropolodias, um, these particular ones are from East Africa. And a subgenus, Ropolodiella, was um, erected for this. Um, but there are notes in, the, in Elizabeth's paper that um, when you bring in the marine ropolodias, um, you can really um, tell that Ropolodia is paraphyletic. So there, there does still need to be um, some work here. But um, because of um, their, uh, Elizabeth's um, approach to um, the reclassification is to, was to um, include um, use the, the, the group that includes more um, diversity and will be least disruptive um, to the research community. So in fact, they did propose to um, include all Ropolodia into epithemia, um, but not all have been transferred. And um, based on uh, this kind of work as shown on the slide, um, there is um, more um, genetic work also to be done because these more worm-like um, ropolodias were not part of the um, molecular data set used in the, the rock paper. So Sylvia, was that other than other than a, this well the subgenus ropolodiella and obviously a subgenus epithemia, are, were there other subgenera that were suggested within the genus? Epithemia? Um, not that I read, but may need to look at this paper again um, to okay. see. Yeah, Rob, Rob says, you know, thank you for so clearly illustrating the, the synapomorphies of the Sorella image or the Sorellas and said great, you know, great clear images. And from uh, Gina uh, said, I thank you, Sylvia. I evidently need to get caught up on my diatom name changes for this group. I think that's a, that she, Gina, I think speaks for all of us at this yes. stage including myself oh, and geez. for the uh, illustrations. Um, I really thank the researchers who took those images and I'm just a messenger. Uh, yes. Um, I had one, one question, um, Sylvia, how, with the, with sort of the, some of the, the, the breakups and especially this, um, this, uh, you know, clear separation of the Bassett, 
Basilary ailes and the Surreal ailes. I'm, I'm curious, have any other, have any researchers um, sort of pers pursued this with the fossil record and um, looked at whether the, the fossil record is supporting these, um, these phylogenies? Or is that another area of needed research? Yeah, I, I have not come across that. Um, and I know that now you could do um, time calibrated phylogenies, but I have not seen that um, for this group. Okay. okay. Um, let me check if we've got any hands raised. Feel free again if you have questions to, uh, um, uh, to pop them in the chat. I wanted to ask just sort of a, a generic question for the practitioners out there. Um, if you're if you're looking at a at a NITSIA, what 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 do you what do you, what, do you, what do you want your eyes to go to in terms of helping to identify and separate these things? I, I know we're talking mostly at the genus level here, but what types of uh, things would would you you know as a as a, a practitioner out there sitting at the scope? What should they be? What should their eyes be directed at when they're seeing something like the you know the things like the like Nitsia, which you know we know is a really, really diverse group. Well, I would definitely look at the shape of the ends, whether there's a central nodule and uh, fibula and striae density if that's resolvable. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay. Gina says, outline stri and fibulae count. So it looks mm -hmm. like we've come to a consensus. Uh, take a look at the shape, the ends, and those, whether that, what, you know, the stri and fibulae counts and determine whether it, it has that, uh, that central nodule on there as well. And, and she says, <laughs> and despair if they're numerous and diverse. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Yep, spacing. Yeah, and Rob says, "Yep, spacing of the of the fibula, um, mm -hmm. and, and count." I sometimes think about how many, uh, how what the relationship between the fibula and the stri are. You know, is there multiple stri between each fibula? One stri between each fibula? Things that uh, are helpful to, um, you know, compare as well. Just mm -hmm. to help you think about what there's, what what we see there. Yeah, um, and what Rob was speaking about was whether the fibulae are neatly um, spaced or if it's more irregular. Okay. Yep. Good call. Oh, I was I was I was taken aback by some of the the graphics you showed from David Mann's paper that sort of starts pointing at the work we work we still need to do in particular the multiple 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 lineages of of um, of Nitsia that are you know through are all throughout the, that tree there but even things that you know we sort of sometimes felt a little more comfortable with like Triblianella obviously are are groups that need um, you know need work um, to, to help, you know, better understand this, this type of diversity, um, as well as, you know, the ramifications of that are going to be, have to be reflected in our taxonomies and our, and our, our web resources. Um, uh, Janai wa wanted to know, um, she says, it, it's interesting to know about the diatoms at the freshwater, um, marine interface. And it, it, she's curious if, about cylindrotheca and how they differ between different environments. Yeah, I think you're talking about um, in the marine environment, there is a lot of this um, cylindrotheca clusterium <laughs> that's very spindly and kind of curvy, whereas the freshwater representatives are you know, they do have a bent to them as well, um, but not as extended um, at the apices like um, this one does. And maybe that has to do with um, the way that they live in their habitat. Um, 
I wonder if uh, the marine um, cylindrotheca spend more time in the plankton possibly um, than the very epipelic um, freshwater representatives. Hey, hey Janai, do you do you ever see this this cylindrotheca gracilis in your in your your, your San Francisco? You work in San Francisco Bay, right? Does, does it ever does it ever pop into your into your samples there? You can throw something in the chat or turn on your mic if you want. I'm just curious. We had a lot of fun looking through her plankton samples. Yeah, it was fun. Oh, am I am I on? Yes, yep, you're yeah. on. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I actually don't know because I, I rarely get to see them at high enough magnification to really tell who's who, but I definitely get a lot of cylindrotheca. But it's mostly this, this uh, the clostridium forms? I think so. Yeah. That's, I, just, I'm just, I was just curious. I, kn I know you, you ended up sort of working at that interface and we, you know, when we find the grassless form, the one that's in inland inland waters, it's typically in some high, you know, somewhat higher conductivity type sites. And so I just was curious if you started seeing it on that in those coastal, those coastal samples as well. Yeah, I'll have to look more closely. Okay. And uh, Janai started using burn mounts for her samples. So that's a good way to to um, capture the cylindrotheca because of their light solicitation. Yeah, well, very, yeah, that's, that's, it's like the only way to see the darn things. So when we, when we teach, teach our field course in Iowa, we make an effort to find a good sample, we can, we can make burn mounts of and try to see how, see how many students can, can see the invisible, the invisible cylindrotheca grassless. You know. Oh, any more any more questions from people? Huh? Rob says um, some of the changes seem to beg for artificial groupings to continue to help with our light microscope work. Are are people devising their own schemes to deal with morphology versus molecular data? Um, well, that makes me think of voucher floras and how. Um, a lot of times um, for very difficult groups and species complexes, um, you would, because most of the work is at the light microscope, um, you do have to create some practical um, groupings that are, you know, based on, still based on understanding of morpho morphology and how that changes um, the variation that you would expect within a um, taxonomic group or taxonomic unit. Um, but a lot of these molecular um, data analyses um, can be um, backed up with morphology um, oftentimes. Um, but of course, it's not always um, the rule. Um, so yeah, there, there are um, instances when you for a practical for the practical aspect of it you do have to group um, by morphology that um, may include some uh, cryptic or pseudo cryptic taxa within there and whether or not you can actually name them <laughs> yes <laughs> right <laughs> Uh, that's a that's a that's a good question, Rob, and I, I I do think it gets at the you know at the heart of what you know what what we 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 need to that we what we face when we're you know sitting with sitting at the microscope you know trying to get get through a, get through counts and uh, and and think about how we're going to approach these these problems and and even balance it with the you know the changes that are coming from our um, the various research 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 methods that are going on and you know and the, the nomenclatural and taxonomic changes that occur as a result as well so, well i don't see any more questions in the chat um and we're coming up on the top of the hour i want to i want to i want to you know thank everyone for for joining us um uh for today's uh, diatom web academy and especially thank sylvia for um presenting to us on on, a, on the, the challenges of, of this 
of this uh, the keeled rafe the keeled rafe diatoms. Um, a reminder that uh, the IDS is coming up in August, um, and I had put in the put in the earlier in the chat the link to that. Um, and in lieu of a August Diatom Web Academy, we've got the International Diatom Symposium to, to uh, do that. And again, we'll get back to a Diatom Web Academy in, on September 14th on ancient sedimentary DNA. I want to remind everyone that um, all of the, all of the uh, Diatom Web Academies are recorded and available a few days after the event on the uh, on our, on our uh, YouTube channel, those links can be found at diatomorgs slash news. Um, thank you again, Sylvia. Really appreciate your, 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 your time today and especially how clearly you were able to show us the, oh, the, the challenges of this, of this challenging group of diatoms. Thanks, Mark. It was very fun and um, hope to see many of you at um, the International Diatom Symposium and if, if not, um, in September when the Web Academy returns. Thanks, everyone. Right. Thanks.